When Eastern State Penitentiary changed over to a congregate system officially in 1913, that meant that the inmates were dining together, living together, playing sports together, exercising together. So it changed everything the way that it originally started out, right? Originally started out as a separate system. So they built these dining halls in the 1920s, okay? And what would happen was the um, inmates would come gather here. Hold on, switch my walkie off. They would gather single file lines and then they would walk down, follow me, through this space. We have a pantry on the left. And then they would Y off to these two windows and pick up their chai food. You can see up here is the remnants of a heating lamp, so we know that their food was kept warm for them. And here is a picture of what it would have looked like while it was in use. Any plans to restore these? Um, yes, actually, we do have plans to restore the roofs and uh, bring it back to, to the way it was in those the way it pictures. Was. Yes. Hold on. Um, so then they would go back into two single file lines, holding their trays, stop here, perhaps for cold items, dessert items, coffee, tea, diet items. There's two diet kitchens in the penitentiary. One you just saw in the synagogue, which is where they would make kosher meals. Another is in the hospital wing where they would make meals for those who are diabetic, etc., who need special, special meals. Then they would take their trays again and turn and go into either one of these sections which were the dining hall. This still has tables in the back where you can see. Wow. Would have sat up to 800 prisoners at a time. So that meant at the height of uh, its population in 1939 when there were 1800 prisoners at Eastern State Penitentiary, they would of course had to have eaten in shifts. Get their food, sit down, eat quickly, get back up, put your, your dishes where they go, and go back. So they had breakfast, lunch, and dinner in here? Yes. And I have a menu. So it, it was the other side, too, if you want to see the other side. Sure. Is this the kitchen? Yeah, this is all the kitchens. There's a lot of kitchen space. This isn't as well preserved as the other side. You can see where the earth is kind of eating it. It's going to take a lot of hard work to get it back yeah. <laughs> in a good shape. Um, but I have a sample menu from April 17th, 1949. So what's today? Those Thursday? Mm -hmm. Okay. So on Thursday, they would have had grilled mixed stewed fruits, French toast, two slices, syrup, bread, coffee, milk, and sugar for breakfast. For lunch, baked pork sausage links, southern gravy, fried potato cakes, peas, carrots, and butter, sweet relish, bread, coffee, and milk. And for dinner, they would have baked macaroni, a la gratin, bread pudding with custard sauce, bread, hot tea with sugar. Wow. So pretty comparable to what people were eating at the time outside the walls. At different moments in the tenure here at Eastern State Penitentiary, there were gardens, vegetable gardens. There was a piggery here at one point. But most of the food supplies came from Greaterford. Greaterford is uh, 35 miles outside Philadelphia and was like the, the farm prison. So they supplied most of the foodstuffs, the raw foodstuffs. You want to see a real big prep kitchen? Okay. Watch your step, okay? Okay. The pavement just gets pretty uneven out here. Understandable. Give me some good footage here to use. This is one of my favorite spots. I'll show you. In here is this big prep kitchen. You can see the big hood over there. Wow, it's collapsed. Mm -hmm. Well, the hood's intact. And then if you come over here and look kind of lean against this wall, you can see oven space and more over range. Over this and more off. See a squirrel in there. Oh yeah, they live here. <laughs> it's gonna take a lot of hard work to get this back into good condition too. Mm -hmm. Here, stand here and look over that way. See the oven? 
Yeah, I do. Amazing. The dining hall. Um, there's two ways they could have been set up. So the pictures from the 60s here. So horizontally. Oh, you saw that one. Oh, I don't have the other one. Or vertically, so we'll just imagine. But this is a decorated... For Christmas for time? Christmas time, yeah, for the holidays. Beautiful. Isn't that great? Yeah. All right, so that's the dining alley. The alley four. Only a couple minutes. And then in... Let me see, what time is it? 3.30. Petty thefts. Let's talk about when he was doing time here. I'm oh, talking when he was doing time here? He what kind of projects he would do? Oh, uh, well, he was a mason. So he would do projects around the prison with the stones, kind of shoring up, making sure things were in working condition. That would explain. So the bars you're asking about that are on the, that's so that you don't go into the cell. So the only way for staff to go in there would be to remove them. Right, right. Or to duck under them, but. It's to, yeah, it's to discourage people from self-investigating. <laughs> yeah, my camera can do that for me. That's why I zoom in. That's how close I'm going to get to going inside. Wow. This glass had it. That is a psychiatric viewing door to a psychiatric viewing cell. So those doors were put in in the 1950s. Um, these rooms that have these doors on them are used to house patients with mental illness. And Thank instead you. of having the lattice frame, uh, the lattice uh, iron works, and then a wooden door, which they could injure themselves with, they put these steel doors on with the window pane so that the doc, the psychiatrist, could look in and view them and make sure that they were still safe inside the cell. Like serious mental issues, like such yes. as schizophrenia? Yes. Uh I figure. So one of the one of the biggest criticisms of the separate system or solitary confinement was that it would make people go insane, um, and certainly there was a lot of mental illness that was treated in the hospital wing of Eastern State Penitentiary. Okay, um, but really the big story about Eastern State's hospital wing is tuberculosis, tuberculosis, tuberculosis. I heard about. I heard there's a TV alley here. Well, there's, um, there is an alleyway. There would have been a courtyard uh, out here that would have been a group exercise yard for those with tuberculosis. The modern wisdom at the time to treat tuberculosis was with plenty of fresh air, sunshine, and masked exercise. So certainly we wouldn't treat a lung disease with masked exercise nowadays, but that's what they did at the time. So if you look through on the left-hand side as we're walking through, you'll see these cells that have these big wooden doors with the iron bars behind them where the um, inmates could open up those wooden doors and have lived basically in outdoor conditions. They would get plenty of sunshine, plenty of light, um, and this is uh, thought to uh, stop the progression of tuberculosis. Which, that's not the case today. Um, no, today there is an antibiotic that's available. There is a cure for tuberculosis. And you also get TB shots too, especially because I work for the YMCA as a sworn instructor, it's mandatory for people like me to get a TV, a TV shot because I'm working around preschool age kids in, right. the, in the pool. Mm -hmm. And TB is the kind of disease that spreads in places that are humid with lots of kind of human bodies around. So it's kind of prison is the perfect spot for it to spread. So for about 100 years from uh, 1830s to the 1930s, it was an epidemic in Eastern State Penitentiary. Wow. Mm -hmm. So these solarium rooms, or what they were called, were built to accommodate the inmates that contracted TV. I see why you have these fans here. Yeah, it's stuffy in here. Were there ever air conditioners in here? No. There were centralized heating and centralized plumbing before the White House had it, but there was no air conditioner. I'm sure, any plans to install air conditioner? I doubt it. <laughs> it would be far
far too expensive and it would... Does the heating still work? Um, no, we don't use the centralized heating system. Then. I'm talking about in the winter time. No. So we'd have to bundle up. Yes, very much. Because so. it gets cold. It gets very cold. So as we walk into this section of the hospital block, what do you notice that's different from the section we were just in? A lot of collapsed cells. Yes, but look up. What's the difference between these two spaces? That ceiling's in poor condition, very bad condition. Now look behind you in this at that ceiling. What do you see? Rotting. And? Deterioration. And what's coming through the top of the, see the light? Yeah, sunlight. Now, now look over here at the ceiling. You see sunlight? No. Okay, the reason is, in 1922, they were so overrun with patients that had tuberculosis that they had to build a solarium section, solarium cells on top of this roof, okay? And so, of course, it blocked out the, sc the skylights, and it also caused the roof underneath to become unstable. This was the main project to get this stabilized for public, public viewing, was this roof here. What you can also tell is if you walk up here with me, this division between the brick and plaster and then the lath and plaster? Yeah. So this this wing didn't go, it, it only went up this far to where the brick ends until 1880. And wow. then it became so busy and they had to build more cells for more patients with tuberculosis that they had to build on to make more room for patients. So it's really cool because you can see the division between the styles of building from before 1880 to after 1880. Originally, the cell block only went up to that half gate, that white half gate. And then it was used for workshop space and they housed inmates who were elderly and had mobility issues because they hadn't yet finished putting the security doors on the cells but el the elderly inmates and those with mobility issues weren't seen as a flight risk, so they were housed here in that front part. Then, as it slowly turned into a hospital unit, they had to build these cells here, these dozen cells, past the white gate, the half gate. Excuse me, flight risk, what do you mean? That they weren't a flight risk. That they were, because they had mobility issues or were elderly and had trouble walking or maneuvering around and there weren't security doors on their spaces. So the majority of these prisoners otherwise were a flight risk. Well, if they didn't have mobility issues, it was more reasonable to assume that they, you know, if they were healthy and younger, that they could potentially be a flight risk. Now, what about those who would be injured in riots? So there's definitely riots that happen here later in the tenure, later in the time period that Eastern State is opened, most notably in the 60s. Um, they certainly would have been treated here for lacerations, things of that nature. What about broken limbs? Absolutely, they definitely reset bones in, in this space. And we're going to look at the operating room where you can see where they did that. There's an operating room in here, wow. which is pretty cool. See, all these cells are in poor condition. Right, because this is a stabilized ruin. So we don't... Um, That's why you don't allow people to go into these cells physically. Right. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's, a, that's an amazing breeze, I feel, it's coming from this cell. Oh, I'm going to show you something here. Sure. So right here is one of six original feeding holes that we have left. So originally, when Eastern State was built, in 1829 and the 1830s, what they had was instead of these doors that you see to get into the cell, all the cells only had this feeding hole in which the guards would come down and slide a tray into here to feed, to give food to the inmate. Okay, because it was solitary confinement, it separated the inmate again from human contact by just using that to communicate with them essentially. What happened to the rest of these? Were they all cemented over? The reason the reason that we don't have these anywhere else in the prison is because they needed this would have so if this was anywhere else in the prison, they would have cut this open and put a door like this in because they would have housed have to house inmates in there, right? Here 
we have a bigger space where you can fit multiple beds. You know, in a hospital situation, you can have multiple beds in one space or used for a, a dispensary or a pharmacy or all the other kinds of facilities they would need to have a functioning hospital. So we'll go up here and we can have a seat to talk about some of the technology too. So Eastern State Penitentiary Hospital is one of the best prison hospitals in Pennsylvania. It's always kind of at the forefront for technology and care. Um, and this is evidence of it. In 1917, they installed an x-ray room. Um, so we have the x-ray room here and then the, the dark room to develop the film. And then on this board here, we have a picture um, from the 60s, I believe, uh, or late 50s, of a staff member receiving a chest x-ray. He's receiving a chest x-ray to make sure that he does not already have tuberculosis. Okay, again, it's a disease colloquially called consumption. Do you know why it was called consumption? I don't know. Well, look at this gentleman here. He's suffering from TB, and his body looks as if it's being consumed by the disease. Oh, makes sense. Right? So um, it made it difficult to eat. It made it difficult to keep food down. It caused diarrhea. And um, made it difficult to breathe. Yes. Yeah. I heard tuberculosis is fatal, too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, out of the 1,400 deaths that occurred in Eastern State Penitentiary, um, we know that at least 546, I believe, are attributed directly to tuberculosis. And then there's about another couple hundred that are attributed to things like pleurisy or pneumonia, which one could attribute to tuberculosis or as a side effect of tuberculosis. So you could say that almost roughly half of the deaths that occurred at Eastern State during its tenure were caused by tuberculosis. I wonder, were there anyone who died from injuries suffered in riots? Um, I don't know the answer to that. If anyone here d died from injuries from riots, I don't know the answer. But I could look it up or I could ask somebody. Because I've watched the news and heard about prison riots before and heard that prisoners have died in riots. Absolutely, they have in riots, yes. I'm just not sure about here. And guards as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, and over here, this is a really cool room. This is the hydrotherapy room. So those afflicted with tuberculosis would be um, uh, treated with ice baths. Those poles there, they can hold on to to lower themselves into the bath. We start, we don't really use ice baths to treat much anymore. There's another one of those holes you were telling yeah, me about. there's another feeding hole. But this one's open. Mm -hmm. I see another. Mm -hmm. There's, I think, six of them, half a dozen of them. Psychotherapy. This is physiotherapy. Oh, so again, physiotherapy. exercise, they saw exercise as a valuable cure to tuberculosis or a preventative measure. So there's a physiotherapy. <laughs> and then behind you over here is the laboratory. And I remember when we took the uh, Soup Alley tour, as I talked about the other diet kitchen, this is it. Uh, on the left over here, you can see the stove. And there's this great uh, image here of Norman Masonholder, an inmate here in the, hospital, in the diet kitchen in 1958. Uh, inmates that suffered from tuberculosis were fed a special diet heavy on protein and fats, again, to negate the consumptive nature of the disease. Wow. another solarium cell there. And then the psychiatric department. So the 50s as psychiatry gains credence in the scientific and medical communities, um, they set up a psychiatric department here to deal with those that have suffer from mental disease and illness. It's so highly regarded that other prisoner, other prisons send their prisoners here to be treated. And here's another feeding hole, and you can see what it looks like with the door on it. That's a picture from 1960, and then an image of the dispensary in 1960, or the 60s also. As we walk up here, one of my favorite kind of screen like shots of these inflation is right through the door. Oh, yeah. 
can first. I don't want to move it. If you can kind of look through there and you see a bed in the background, this would be a recovery space in the back. Do you see it? Yeah, I see it. Is there any way to open this door? No, I, I don't want to mess with it. It was more open, but it looks like someone has closed it for now, and I don't want to. Because this is an old door. Mm -hmm. And if someone closed it, that means it's probably supposed to be closed. Makes but sense. But it's pretty cool to see the beds back there. Now we go into the last part of the tour of the hospital, and this is the operating room. Wow. This space right here would be where the surgeon, doctors, assistants washed up to sterilize themselves for the procedure. And then as we walk in here, we see the big lamp. And this is the actual space in which the surgery's operations would occur. This image here is from 1910. It was built in 1910. This image is from 1912. You can see the original ceiling in the picture, which is above you. However, the lamp, the fixture, is from the 1950s, so as technology changed, this light was taken out, and you can see this light in the pictures here. Um, it's on a track so that it can be slid back and forth to help with lighting. And what kind of procedures do you think would have happened in a prison operating room? Like maybe, um, hard to say. You mentioned some earlier. Oh. Like bone setting. Yeah, bone setting. Stitching up the lacerations in case you got in a fight, things like that. What about stomach pumping? I don't know if stomach pumping happened, but perhaps. Um, but also tattoo removal and plastic surgery. Um, there's also open heart surgery happened here. I recently read something uh, in one of our sources that in the 1930s, they offered optional plastic surgery to inmates here to prepare them to go back out into the outside world. Um, they offered them surgery to make their faces look more kind and appealing to and the better. outside world. I'm not really sure what that means, but... Um, it's kind of controversial. Yeah, definitely controversial. I don't think that that would be acceptable to do now. Yeah. Um, also, uh, Al Capone had his tonsils removed here. And uh, according to his family, he was also circumcised here as a way to prevent the spread of syphilis, a disease which he eventually died from. That's what killed him? Mm-hmm. Complications from syphilis. I heard that Capone also did time at Alcatraz. He did, after he was here at Eastern State. Oh, look. This is really cool. Remember how this was a forest? Yeah. So there's a big piece of tree trunk that used to live in here. So we left it so that we would remember what this place looked like before we came in and tried to stabilize it. So that's it. a remnant of one of those trees that mm -hmm. grew through the structures of the prison. Uh-huh. Absolutely. That would explain why some of the cells are collapsed. That is the main explanation is the earth eating the site, reclaiming the stone. And technically the... Technically the area around this prison all used to be forest. Like, it did. This used to be called Cherry Hill because it was an orchard of cherry trees. I, I thought it was called Penn Forest. Maybe sections of it, but the space that this, inhabit, this space inhabits was Including the Hill. block I live at was also once part of that forest. Yeah. yeah. I seen a documentary about it on History Channel once. Oh, really? Uh-huh. Yeah, so Penn Forest probably was behind, behind us or where you live. Yeah, it was all out in the in the country until the 1950s, 40s and 50s. So that's what Brown Street looked like then. Mm-hmm, all trees. Any more questions? No, that'll be all. Okay. It's amazing. Have you seen Al Capone's cell? Of course I've seen his cell. Okay. <laughs> On either side, too, you can see um, spaces that were visitation rooms and recovery rooms. So visitors can come in and visit the inmates that were recovering? Yes. I think it was probably based on each, you know, case is separate. But we have a picture of a boxing champion in the 1930s uh, visiting an inmate. Um, but I'm not sure that he visited an inmate specifically or just came in to see a bunch of inmates, you know, as, as someone to lift their spirit. 
if you look in here, there's a um, shower space, which is pretty cool. Right here on the left. Because I know that prisoners who did time weren't necessarily rotten to the core. They just were there because they made poor choices. Poor choices, absolutely. And that's, I mean, that's part of the basis of how Eastern State was, was built upon the basis of um, the innate goodness of humans. All right, you ready? Can sure. stand against this wall because of storage and the other way. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you know the story of how Al Capone came to be here? No, I don't. Do you want me to tell you the story? Go ahead, tell me. All right, hold on. Let me lock this, and then I'll take you over there. Okay. I got to see where I'm supposed to be. I'm not sure. I lost the schedule. Nah, don't worry about it. Are you sure? It won't take very long. What I mean by don't worry about is... You're still getting paid. <laughs> and you're giving me plenty of video to record. Okay, good. I'm glad. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. The killer, but he just didn't commit no. Well, he was never on tax evasion in Philadelphia, the Eastern State. Um, he was he was caught for uh, possessing an uh, unlicensed firearm. So here's his cell. You've seen it, right? Yes, I've seen it. So Al Capone was a notorious gangster during Prohibition, right? Um, he was famous. All gangsters were famous, but no, none as famous as Scarface Al Capone. What was his nickname, Scarface? Scarface. He was at a gangster conference in Atlantic City on his way back to Chicago when he missed his connecting train in Philadelphia and decided to go catch a movie with his bodyguard. When he got to the movie, everyone recognized him. He was famous. People knew who he was. The Philadelphia PD caught wind of it and they said to themselves, listen, this is our opportunity to bag a guy that they keep trying to convict and no one's caught him on anything. He's never been in prison before, but we know he's a bad guy. And if we catch him, we're going to be, everyone's going to be so proud of us. We're going to be the best cops ever, right? So they pull him and his bodyguard over and lo and behold, they're both carrying unlicensed weapons. They make an example out of him and sentence him to the maximum sentence for carrying an unlicensed weapon, which is a year. One year? One year. Prison sentences weren't very high back then. Okay, so it's one year. He served seven and a half months on good behavior. Um, and once he leaves here, he goes through a string of convictions and spends time, time in and out of incarcerated in and out of prisons. Including Alcatraz. Including Alcatraz, where he spends a significant amount of time and then is released uh, is released because of his failing health. He moves to Florida and lives out the last eight years of his life uh, suffering from syphilis. And then passes away. Mm -hmm. Do you have a schedule? I don't, I don't know where I'm supposed to be. So Thank you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So you're saying Al Capone was caught by the Philadelphia Police Department? Yes, for carrying an unlicensed weapon, a 38.